Today, we're going to have a little different direction for a few weeks on voting our biblical values. Massive election coming up. Huge implications for our country. And it's alarming to me when I hear certain Christians proclaiming uh, an attitude when it comes to politics that is a major departure from a biblical worldview. Uh, the Bible is the foundation of our Christian faith, and it's our all-encompassing rule for faith and conduct. And when we become a Christian, we may have certain opinions that as we read our Bibles or we hear messages proclaimed from the pulpit that induce an aha moment. Aha, I see that my opinion on that matter is not really in agreement with what the Bible teaches. Now, the Bible is God's thoughts on the matter. Our opinions are our thoughts on the matter. Let me clue you in. God's not going to change his mind. Which means we're going to need to humble ourselves and change our mind. Now, the other reason I feel it's very important to be going through this is I, I feel it's my responsibility as a pastor to help educate you as to how the Bible speaks to the issues that we have to deal with, even in this modern culture, and that it will really help us if we'll give it a chance, and we'll find ourselves on the right track, and we'll experience the path of a more successful life, because we're endeavoring to walk in a manner that's pleasing to God. So if something is said today that you don't agree with, don't get resentful and just stomp out in anger. If you want, we can have a chat about it, or you can find someone else in the church here who seems to be more experienced and well-schooled in the issues and say, hey, what do you think about when pastor said this or pastor said that? I want you to know one thing. Renew Church, as a church, does not officially endorse any candidate. I don't really believe it's right for the IRS to put a restriction like that through the Johnson Amendment that's about 60 years old now. And I don't think the IRS has any business infringing upon our First Amendment rights to speak about whatever we want to speak about. But in order to avoid hot water, we don't endorse a candidate. And that's basically what we can't do officially. I can endorse a candidate. And when I express political views in that matter, I put those on my personal Facebook page, not on the church Facebook page. It is not wrong at all in the eyes of the law for us to teach what the Bible says about different issues and even to discuss how different parties or candidates are aligning themselves politically in, in so far as how they relate to those issues. That's perfectly legal. So we're not doing anything wrong here. I know there's always, oh, he's talking about politics. Or are we going to get in trouble? No, we're not going to get in trouble. I know what the laws say. I read through them regularly. And... Uh, I'm not about to get us into some kind of trouble. But I also feel very strongly that Christians everywhere have a responsibility to be engaged in the process and to become informed and to be good stewards of their citizenship and of their votes. So that's why I'm sharing this stuff, to help you in your decision-making process, which I feel is my role. Now, I'm going to start off showing a video, 
And some might say, well, why are you showing a video? You know, it's really hard to be deeply informed on every issue under the sun. And there's some people for whom this is their full-time job. This is their subject area. And I watch the video and I go, I can't say it better than that. That is phenomenal. So we're going to watch about a 19-minute video on the Bible and the immigration issue. And I like it because they're starting out first, stating the case for why Christians should be involved, which goes all the way back to the founding of the nation. So there's a little introduction there. Then they talk about this uh, immigration issue and about how we have, they believe, a sacred charge to vote and to be involved. And then when we, I come back up again, I'm going to drill down a little more on the specific issue of the Bible and the immigration issue. And the other two are very good subjects as well, but we only have so much time, so I'm going to focus in on that one because we really want to apply our biblical values to the immigration issue. So... Even if we are faithless, God remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. Faithfulness is a part of God's character and it should be part of our character. Well, part of our faithfulness should be doing the right thing. We should be faithful to do the right thing. And voting is something that, that we should not allow our emotions to be swayed and say, well, my vote doesn't matter, but your faithfulness does. I'm so glad to be joined with Tim Barton. He is the president of wall builders thank you tim for joining us uh, and having a conversation with us yeah my pleasure yeah so wall builders you guys are focusing on americans and educating us on the constitution yeah tell us a little bit about that yeah yeah so we focus on american history and specifically understanding the connection the the biblical foundation of america as as we and to do that we actually have what's considered the largest private collection of original documents from the founding fathers from the founding era we have letters documents journals from any founding father you can name. We have about 100,000 plus items in the collection. So what we do is we go back to the original documents and, and what we can show very clearly is the most influential document to the founding fathers was the Bible, right? The most influential philosophy was Christianity, the philosophy of Jesus, and it shows up in so much of what they do. And as, as we're looking at the world and culture today, the two things we're trying to help in kind of our niche of what we feel God's called us to is we want to teach people American history because there's so many lies right now being said about America, right? Where people that should be celebrated, honored as heroes, mm -hmm. their statues are being torn down. Yeah. And it's because we have a we have a very faulty understanding of history. We've been lied to. We've we've bought the lie. The adage that if you repeat a lie often enough, right, that that's what people believe. Everybody starts believing it. And, and yeah. that's that's exactly what's happened with so many founding fathers. And then not just the understanding connection from the founding fathers, but we want people to see what the founding fathers did that put us on a path to be the most free, stable, prosperous nation in the history of the world was following biblical principles. Mm -hmm. And it actually makes a lot of sense as a Christian it should make the most sense because yeah. God's ways work. And when you do it God's way, you're successful. And, and, and you can track where some presidents, some leaders, they were terrible and America suffered because of it. Mm -hmm. And then you had some leaders that made good decisions and America benefited because of it. But the good and bad decisions, we would say the measurement of the metric is what the Bible says, right? Because God's ways work. Go back to Deuteronomy 28, where Moses tells the Israelites, before you go and remember, if you do it God's way, everywhere you go, everything you'll do, you'll be blessed. But if you don't go do it God's way, then you suffer those consequences. And the founding father set up a system that allowed freedom to thrive and function, but it only thrived and functioned because of the moral foundation they laid. Yeah. Let me just kind of ask you on that, being that we are, and I believe this, I'm right here with you, that we are, we are founded on these biblical principles. Yeah. What do you say to those people? They're like, Oh, we weren't founded on the biblical. Like all that stuff is garbage. You know, you hear all those naysayers. Like, what do you say to those people? So, generally, we will ask questions to to find out more of where they're coming from, right? Yeah. And, and and really, I want to know like what what evidence do you have that would suggest the founding fathers weren't religious? And really, the fun game for me is I can take the painting. There were fifty six signers of the Declaration. I can take the painting where there's a committee of five presenting the Declaration. John Hancock sitting mm -hmm. in the chair at the table, right? And I can say, okay. Of the 56 signers of the Declaration, how many can you name? <laughs> yeah. Right? And, and I'll, jokingly, I'm like, now let me help you. George yeah. Washington did not sign the Declaration. He was military. Mm -hmm. Right? James Madison, Alexander Hamilton didn't sign the Declaration. They were military. Right. Let me help you further. 
Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin all signed the Declaration. Who else can you name? Now, the reason this matters is— I'm glad you weren't asking me because I don't think I would have been able to answer I didn't want to put you on the spot, right? (laughs) Yeah. But the reason it matters is I want to help them understand we're jumping to a lot of conclusions. You're making a lot of assumptions. Right, yeah. When— you don't even know who they were. Yeah. So then how do you know what they believed or what they didn't believe, right? How, how do we know? What what proof and evidence do we have? Right. And then there's a lot of things that I can walk through on the flip side because I'll point to people like, well, have you ever heard of John Witherspoon? He was the president of Princeton University, which was a Bible college at the time. Correct. He was recruited to Princeton from Scotland where he was a pastor helping lead the Scottish Awakening. Yeah. And he was recruited because he was a Presbyterian and Princeton was a Presbyterian college and they'd have a Presbyterian pastor to be in charge of Presbyterian college. He was an active pastor at the time he signed the declaration. Yeah. Now, he's one of many I can go through that were involved in the Christian ministry, but this is the point is people have never heard the name John Witherspoon. Yeah. So it's, it's easy to jump to conclusions or make assumptions when you don't have knowledge or when you've been fed a steady stream of generalizations. Well, we know the founding fathers yeah. weren't religious. They were atheists, agnostics, and deists. And I'm always like, okay, which ones? Who? who? Because mm-hmm. the only founding father that ever self-identified as a deist was Benjamin Franklin. Mm-hmm. But he did it in his autobiography, which you can find online. I want to encourage people, go look this up. You, you can search his autobiography online, right? Go to it on Google Books, the search tab, and type in deist and see what pops up. Because there's like two and a half, three paragraphs. Yeah. And he says, when I was 15 years old, I was reading the debates between some pastors and some deists, and I thought, you know, the deists are making a better argument than the pastors are, so I determined I was going to be a deist. Next paragraph. Upon further consideration, (laughs) it, it appeared to me that although their arguments were better in some respects, that the belief itself was not going to be of any use to me and was of no real benefit to anyone else, so I quickly left that belief behind. Yeah. The only founding father that ever self identifies as a deist said that he, he quickly left it behind. So he's a deist for maybe a, a day and a half, right? Like, th- th- that's who you have. <laughs> yeah. But people have never read his autobiography. They, they've never read the writings of Franklin or Washington or Jefferson or Adams. We spend our time digging into this research, and, and I can acknowledge, I wouldn't say every founding father was a Christian, but, but even the guys like Franklin, who I would say weren't a Christian, he still advocated that we should follow the teachings of Jesus and the mm. principles of the Bible because it would allow us to be the freest society that there yeah, had been. It works. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. It, yeah. And it's interesting, too, because you were talking about, you know, a lot of these people were believers or Presbyterian pastors. And that's what I tell people. Like, do you realize that how many, how much of a influence that pastors had? Yes. In, in the uh, founding of our nation. A hundred percent. It's crazy. So you know? to, to give you a, a, a tidbit on that, there was a, a professor from Duke University back in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Her name was Alice Baldwin. She wrote a book called The New England Clergy and the American Revolution. In her book, she identified that if you look at the Declaration, every single issue in the Declaration had been preached from American pulpits prior to 1763, yeah. right? A dozen years before there's ever a revolution, there's ever a Declaration of Independence, and the reason it matters, she points out, is when the founding fathers come up with all their ideas, all their ideas were not ones they came up with. It's what they had learned from their pastors yeah. that they get together and they're like, hey, we should do this one. Those were all their pastors' ideas. And this was a noted historian from Duke University, writes an entire book on the subject. And and this is what today people don't understand. This used to be common knowledge, Mm -hmm. like understood throughout America, the Christian foundation of this nation. And it's only been in more recent decades that people have begun to buy into this notion that no, we were always secular. We should be secular. We don't want God involved. No, we, we will not succeed if God's not involved. If you remove the principles of Christianity in the Bible, it's very similar to what David wrote in the Psalms. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If you pull the foundation out from the house, it won't stand. Yeah. So we see this infiltration happening in our country, and it's attacking every issue, uh, gender, sexuality, and immigration. Immigration is a huge yeah. issue uh, right now, and a lot of a concern for many voters, too. Who, who did this, the founding fathers say uh, or, or see as responsible for immigration? This is a really fascinating question. We're in the middle of a research project on this right now. The Constitution outlines the specific role of the federal government. They were called enumerated powers. Hmm. And most of them are like in Article 1, Section 8, the powers of what Congress has. But, but the Constitution literally says, here's what Congress can do, here's what the president can do, here's what judiciary can do. And it 
lays out those powers. It then goes on to say that any power not granted to the federal government belongs to the state. Mm -hmm. Well, the Constitution had very little to say on immigration, and this is where the Founding Fathers believe that's really a state issue. Why? Because if you were coming to America, even though generally speaking you were coming to live in the United States of America, no, that's not where you're really living. You were living in Virginia or yeah. Pennsylvania right. or Delaware, and so those states would determine some parameters mm -hmm. of what was required to live in their state, and, and the Constitution allowed states to have a significant voice, and by allowed, meaning that because the Constitution didn't say this is a role of the federal government, by default, it says this is the role of the state, and it wasn't until there was two Supreme Court decisions, one in 1875, one in 1876, where the Supreme Court said, yeah, really the federal government should step in and help fix some hmm. immigration issues yeah. we're having. It, it, it's, it's an interesting thing to wrap your head around. Immigration was not a federal issue, really, until you get to about the 1890s, because that's when Ellis Island opened. And all of a sudden, we have this main federal immigration port. Before that, it was always a state issue. And the reason for the founders that made the most sense is because at the local level, you have more control by your local populace because of who they're voting for. And the representatives are reporting directly to them. Mm -hmm. And so there was... A, it wasn't this distant, absent, somebody in Washington, D.C. that we don't know, we haven't seen in years or months or whatever it is. No, this was something that people were directly accountable to people, and they had a big say in this, and they believed it belonged primarily to the states and the local level to handle their own immigration issues. Fascinating. Yeah. It's, it's so counterculture what what we're hearing. Right. In all the news and all the media, it's, just, it's crazy. So my faith votes, we, we call for Christians to pray yes and to think and to vote obviously immigration is such a huge issue yeah how is the christian to think about mm. this issue because i think i see it in two ways we got two lanes we've got one care and compassion and one law and order yes are are they in sync with each other or am i missing something like how do we think about this before yes. we go to the polls it is it's such an important question and this is where it's a challenge for people sometimes but you 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 can't yeah. walk and chew gum right like two things can be true at once yeah and when you go back to the very beginning when when god creates adam and eve right he creates individuals mm -hmm. the individual capacity but then from individuals he creates families mm -hmm. we would say that's an institution god created right. well we also know that God creates an institution of government. We could maybe go to Genesis 9, uh, where God gives Noah what were considered the, the laws of Noah. They became known as the Noahide laws. And, and in that was things for civil government. And then God creates an institution of the church, really, right? right. It's Exodus. It's a temple. It's Aaron, yep. Levites. But we know there's three institutions. And one of the important ways to think through this is, is whose jurisdiction does this fall in? Yeah. Right? Because if we're talking about a nation— Who's supposed to be in charge of protecting the citizens of the nation? The government. Yeah. Now, why that matters is the government's been charged with, the founding fathers believe, right? The role of the government is to protect your God-given rights. What you see in scripture is the role of the government is to punish the wicked right. and to reward the righteous. Right. That, that's the Romans primary 13. role, yep. right? That's a primary role of government. The role of government is not compassion. Mm -hmm. now, now, it's interesting because yeah. injustice, right, if, 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 there was someone who's a murderer and the judge is like, I'm going to have compassion. I'm going to say not guilty. That, that's no not justice. your job, yeah. right? The family, that's good. right, from the murder victim, they can say, we forgive you. But but the role of the government is to protect citizens, to do justice, to punish the wicked. And when you look at immigration, the, the primary role of government is to protect its citizens. Mm -hmm. Right now, if you have an open border, the, the government just by self-evident understanding cannot be protecting its citizens yeah. because they don't even know who's coming into this nation. We do know that there are nations in Central and South America that are emptying out their prisons from violent offenders, right? Murderers, sexual predators, and they're sending them up because they know yeah. they can get them out of their country. They don't have to pay for them in prison and America's embracing them. The federal government is messing up on this issue. Now, here's where you can walk and chew gum. We can still look and say, but we do have a broken immigration system in America. I, I would agree with that assessment. Right. When you look at people that have tried to be legal immigrants and they've gone through a four, five, six, seven year process to become a legal immigrant when they're people that love America, they have jobs, they have homes, they want to be here. We should make it easy for people that want to be here to be here. Mm -hmm. And it should be a challenge for people 
who have bad intentions to make it in this nation. Yeah. Th- th- yeah. That should be an obvious immigration Seems statement. Like a no-brainer, but right. for some it's not. <laughs> but but that's not what we're doing. So this yeah. idea where someone would say, well, right, if, 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 we, if we put up a border, that's not loving. Well, hang on. The role of the government mm-hmm. is to protect its citizens. Yeah. It would be unloving for the government not to protect their citizens, right? Yeah. I mean, we've confused this concept. And it's not to say that, you know, well, we, we should have bigger ports of entry and there should be more agents to process. Now, that's a different conversation. Mm-hmm. But, but at that point, we're still saying we want to know who comes in to make sure we're not releasing murderers and rapists and drug dealers or whoever else into the nation without knowledge. The, the role of the government is to protect their citizens. Yeah. And right now, I mean, it, it's, it should not be confusing to anyone. The government's not protecting citizens when it comes to the immigration issue. This is something as Christians that it should be clear. And we can go further. If you look in Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, even some in Exodus, it talks about if there are strangers that come into your land, mm-hmm. there is one law for the stranger, for the sojourner, yeah. and for God's people. Well, yeah. God's standard was if people are going to live here, they need to follow the laws. Right. That's not a racist thing to say. Right. That, that, that's, that's also not something that should be super subjective. If you come here, you should want to be here, number one. And number two, you should follow the laws. And the laws are there is a legal process to get in. And again, we can talk about it, should that be changed. That's a different conversation than saying we're not going to follow the laws and open it up and everybody comes in. Yeah, that's so good. So outside of immigration, we know that's a big deal. What do you see as one of the biggest concerns to you um, coming into this big election year? I would say one of the things that I know you guys are very concerned with, and it's the fact that Christians actually show up and vote. A to the men. And the yes. reason, right, it, but the reason <laughs> it's becoming a bigger deal now is th- there are literally campaigns to try to diminish Christian voter turnout, yeah. right? And, and whether it's, well, we know it's all rigged, right? Or, you know, there's ballot harvesting and there's mail-in ballots and people are cheating, and so it doesn't even matter. And, and, and what I, I try to challenge remind Christians about, if you go to— some of the parables of Jesus. It's so often Jesus' parables started off and he would say, the kingdom of heaven is like this, Yeah. right? Well, if you go to Matthew 25, Luke 19, it was a parable of talents and the minas. Mm-hmm. And at the end of that, who got rewarded? And you could say, well, those that were profitable, those were productive. And I would say, no, those that were faithful. Yeah. Because if you are faithful doing the right thing, you know what happens? You're often productive in what you do, right? Yeah. If yeah. you are faithful doing your job, you will be productive. But they weren't rewarded. He didn't say, well done, good and productive servant. He said, well done, good and faithful servant. Yeah. This is even one of the things that, that, that the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, and he says, this is a trustworthy saying. And in verse 13, I think it's 2 Timothy 2.13, he says that even if we are faithless, God remains faithful, for he yeah. cannot deny himself. Faithfulness is a part of God's character, and it should be part of our character. Well, part of our faithfulness should be doing the right thing. We should be faithful to do the right thing in voting is something that, that we should not allow our emotions to be swayed and say, well, yeah. my vote doesn't matter, but your faithfulness does. Yeah, faithfulness, right? and that's a stewardship thing, too. A hundred yeah. percent stewardship, because in America, more than almost any other nation, arguably in the history of the world, when we have our constitution that recognizes we the people are in charge, yeah, we're, we're the ones that get to choose, which means if we have ungodly leaders, it's because we chose poorly or because we didn't choose at all because we didn't show up. Yeah. And Christians, I would say the number one issue going forward, Christians have to be involved. And Proverbs 14, 34 says, righteousness exalts a nation. Righteousness is not determined by someone's personality, but rather by their policies. And this is a big deal because a lot of times we go, I don't like that person. Okay, I, I get it, but let's let's measure policies. Yeah. And as a Christian, righteousness is not all that confusing because God is a God of life. God is a God of male and female. He created them, and that's what marriage looks like. Yeah. God is a God that Israel is still the apple of his eye. Like you can kind of go down this list. What does righteousness look like? Issues that should not be that confusing for Christians, and this is not determined on someone's personality, right? This is their policies. Who stands for the unborn? Who who believes that marriage is a man and woman? Who believes that men and women are actually things, yeah. right? Who, who <laughs> believes that we should— be friends of Israel. Well, well, those are not complicated issues. Mm -hmm. And then we can go further. Proverbs uh, 29, two, when the righteous are in authority, people rejoice. We have the opportunity to put godly, righteous people there. And the reason we would rejoice is because when we do the godly things, we enjoy God's blessings. And therefore we are rejoicing because life is better Yeah, because God's ways work. But we have to have people that understand and believe and promote God's ways 
for them to get those policies so we can enjoy those blessings. If Christians aren't involved in the process, we're never going to have that. Yeah. Christians have to faithfully show up with their stewardship and vote. And I think that is the biggest issue in this coming election. Yeah, I agree. We are my faith votes. Our faith is in God. We remain faithful and we just trust God with the outcome. Amen. And he's going to be good to us. That's it. Tim, thank you so much, man. My pleasure. Good to be with you. Great having you. Well, praise the Lord. Just a brief comment on the, the end point they were making there about being faithful and voting. Ralph Reed has come out with statistics showing that if all Christians, all those who say they're Christians in the country, would vote, they as a block would pretty much control the outcome of every election. And when you look at that and some of the desperate things we're going through as a nation, it's quite an indictment against the church at large and Christians in general who are so careless with their stewardship of the country so as to not even vote. So I just want to challenge everyone here to make it a priority to make sure you're registered to vote. Uh, we're, we've actually been thinking about how we can get that done here on the next couple Sunday afternoons. And... Um, Get out there and vote. So I want to hit on this idea of the two common views on immigration, which I overstepped one here. Yeah, this is the one. First one he mentioned was the compassionate view. From Deuteronomy 10, we can see this in play. The Lord your God ensures that orphans and widows receive justice. He shows love to the foreigners living among you and gives them food and clothing. So you too must show love to foreigners, for you yourselves were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. The idea being that when Israel was foreigners uh, in the land of Egypt, God had compassion upon them. And so, too, we need to have compassion. Uh, the Lord Jesus was a foreigner when he fled to Egypt. Uh, Abraham was a foreigner. Uh, many examples of God's people being foreigners. And as God took care of them in that status, he wants us to take care of foreigners. That's the compassionate view. But there's another view, and that's the law and order view. Exodus 12, if there are foreigners living among you who want to celebrate the Lord's Passover, let all their males be circumcised. So in other words, you can be a foreigner if you want to be part of things, then you follow the laws of the Israelites. And that's how you become part of the Israelite community, and you're not a foreigner any longer. This is a principle that's been largely overrun with catastrophic consequences. And we don't have to look very far. We can go right to Europe and see how they allowed foreigners in. But we've really given up the melting pot philosophy that I learned in elementary school, that America was a great melting pot, that people came in and their cultures coalesced and we became one nation under God, even though we had a lot of immigrants coming in. And that's the way the attitude was for a long time. That was the biblical attitude. Let all their males be circumcised. Now, just think about that. There are other references to that process in the Bible. And it's not a small thing, especially when you're an adult. It's quite painful. We have examples of people being in pain for a couple weeks pretty much incapacitated. Well, I think that kind of would smite someone's conscience and attitude that being a citizen of this country is a pretty serious deal. <laughs> you know, it doesn't come at a small price here that they had to go through this process. And God said, only then may they celebrate the Passover with you like any native-born Israelite. So in other words, 
God required the foreigner to make a commitment to the laws of this new nation called Israel that they were going to follow the laws, that they were going to become part of the new country, not try to bring everything about their old nation and preserve it and keep it in the new nation. No, you left that. It's like two people becoming married. You leave your respective family, and the two now become one, and you have a new family, and uh, you may still have certain ties, but the former family does not have authority over the new entity here. You're recognized as a new family in the eyes of God. It's kind of the same thing here. We see that principle being expressed. But no uncircumcised male may ever eat the Passover meal. And... What we have going on is you can participate in everything. You're just like a citizen. You have to go through no process whatsoever. No commitment is required. Well, that's not biblical. This instruction applies to everyone, whether a native-born Israelite or a foreigner living among you. Now, like the guy said in the video, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. And I think we're seeing... In my eyes, anyway, this part of it so severely trampled that I kind of lose the heart of compassion. You know, we, we need to remember that there are innocent people getting caught up in something they're not even aware of what they're being caught up in. And we need to have a godly attitude toward them and not despise them. That's different than the attitude we may have toward the cartel members and the people who are viciously exploiting innocent children and all that thing, all, all that sort of thing, but not everybody's in the same ball of wax. So we need to moderate our attitude according to Scripture and how the Holy Spirit informs us. So this instruction applies to everyone, whether a native-born Israelite or a foreigner living among you, as they made the point in the video, the laws apply to everyone. You can't have double, triple, quadruple standards because you'll end up with a chaotic mess that we're dealing with right now. So now I want to advance a third view, the law and order view and a compassionate view. Do not take advantage of a hired worker who is poor and needy, whether that worker is a fellow Israelite or foreigner residing in one of your towns. And there are news reports of this taking place. Uh, I read a story about a meatpacking plant here in the U.S., and they hired very aggressively a bunch of Haitian immigrants, uh, not legal, but they provided them housing. They, this company actually bought housing. The only problem was they were putting like 30 immigrants in three-bedroom homes. And the living conditions were absolutely atrocious that these poor immigrants were, foreigners were being taken advantage of by this American company. And you can imagine 30 people trying to share two bathrooms and three bedrooms, and things were getting so bad that physical fights were breaking out in some of these places, and some of them were desperately wanting to get back to Haiti because it was so horrible what they were going through here. So, you know, we have, we do have companies who are taking advantage of people who are in desperate situations, and that's wrong too. But the reason they're able to do that is because there isn't any law and order. There's not any process of vetting these people and making sure that things are planned out for them and inspections going to these companies and seeing what kind of living conditions these people are going through. So it's really a two-sided thing, and you can't really have true compassion without law and order. I mean, law and order is designed to protect people so that they are not harmed. So some 
are being taken advantage of in unspeakable ways. Some are being sold into sexual slavery or workplace slavery. And Haitians having living conditions that they describe as horrendous. So a lot of these things are multifaceted issues, and there's plenty of blame to go around. But I think when the government gets their mission mixed up, saying that, well, we're exercising compassion, and then we have mixed motives, too. Well, you say that, but are you sure this isn't just a, another voter getting scheme here? That you're getting people in to secure your political power. So lots of things to examine. Do not take advantage of a foreigner residing in one of your towns. And that is definitely happening. Now, according to the Department of Homeland Security, this just came out this week, actually. Shocking statistics. Over 425,000 non-detained criminals have illegally entered the U.S. So, in other words, these people have committed a crime in another country, and they are just here, free to roam around. Now, I see some of the hoops that citizens have to jump through once they commit a crime. And honestly, there are times I'm tempted to think the system's really stacked against them getting back on their feet again. And yet there's absolutely no restriction if you're a non-citizen. Why should that be? Also shocking, 13,099 illegal aliens have been convicted of murder in another country. They are non-detained. They were convicted of murder. They get in the country. Who knows where they are? That is a failure of law and order. 15,811 illegal aliens have been convicted of rape or sexual assault in another country. So this is, what, what do you think is going to happen? And they said it in the video that some Central American countries are just emptying out their prisons. Now, I don't know if you're like me, I've watched some political speeches and I've seen this point brought up and I, I found it a bit incredulous myself in the beginning. Is, could that even be true? How could something like that be true? Could we really be that stupid to do something like that? And then the media will poo-poo the idea until the cows come home and discredit it. Well, this is now coming out from our own Department of Homeland Security. They have the stats, and they're releasing them. And I think some of those folks are just getting sick of the situation and the destruction that is coming into our country. Now, here's something from the Center for Renewing America. On June 18th, President Biden announced new unlawful and unconstitutional executive actions that will allow millions of inadmissible illegal aliens to remain in the country without threat of deportation and puts them on an immediate path to citizenship. What's the rush? We have laws governing this entire process. Like he said in the video, that could be another discussion. Maybe those laws need to be changed. Maybe there needs to be debate about that in the halls of Congress. Maybe there needs to be the consideration of a new system. But right now, we do have laws, and nobody's paying attention to them. What do you say to an illegal alien with a criminal history when they come and just walk right in? Aren't you communicating to that person that, yeah, we have laws, but they don't really matter? Don't worry about them. You just do what you want. I mean, that's what the president is doing. He's just doing what he wants. There are laws governing all these things. And he swore to protect and uphold the Constitution and the laws of the United States of America. And here he's just wiping them away because they don't fit his opinion on how things should be done. 
there's nothing that been decided through the legislative branch which is charged with making the laws that govern the nation. The Biden administration has named these actions parole in place. No legislative process, just him saying this is the way it's going to be. This means that illegal aliens will be eligible for Social Security numbers, green cards and work visas, health care. Now remember, illegal aliens. I think we'd be hard-pressed to find any American who would speak against legal immigration. I mean, we are a country of immigrants. What we're challenging is this whole notion of illegal aliens just coming across the border people just letting them in health care they get health care Obamacare and Medicaid welfare benefits food stamps social security uh, etc federal student financial aid and eventually full citizenship so it's kind of a fast-track system here. Would you say that a system like this is more bent on making sure that the citizens of the United States of America are properly protected? Or would you say that it's more oriented toward a message of compassion and understanding? Which they made the profound point in the video is not the mandate of the government. It's not the government's job to exercise compassion. I remember we had a presidential race some years ago, and I can't remember the candidate, but he was making his point, and he couldn't get a hearing at all. I mean, our, our citizenry has been so brainwashed that the government should meet every one of my needs that... We have these candidates just getting up there and making promises and promises and promises. But they're all unconstitutional promises. It's not the job of the government. Families knit together are to provide compassion for one another. Churches are to provide compassion for the citizenry. Other Christian ministries are well able. We see this happening with Hurricane Helene, where there's been either no government help or greatly delayed government help. And one of the former presidents was there helping out with Samaritan's Purse, while another one was on the beach and the other one was doing campaign fundraising out in California. But... He called on Elon Musk to provide Starlink, which is his innovative system. You know, he's got these satellites all around the globe now. And Starlink is some kind of a device that you can put in your home and just get on the Internet. And Musk immediately responded. They just brought Starlink and started handing it out to the populace in grave danger, living in those disastrous circumstances. And then the next thing you heard was Elon Musk blowing his top. He was so upset because FEMA stopped this charitable contribution by Musk and said, you can't be distributing these. Why, why not? I'm a private citizen. These are my, my product. Why can't I give them to who I want? Well, I think FEMA was concerned with looking bad, that uh, Musk and others were kind of outrunning them and meeting the needs of the citizens. But look what happened there. You had the citizenry, the Christian citizenry, uh, Samaritan's Purse, Convoy of Hope, I'm sure there are others, and all their volunteers came swarming in there, getting the job done. Well, FEMA was saying, well, we have no money left. Why do they have no money left? Because they've given it all in the support of the establishment of these illegal immigrants in the sanctuary cities all around the country where they get debit cards. And who's paying for that? The citizens are paying for that. And then when it's time 
to address the needs of the citizens. Well, we have no money. We can give them $750. What is $750 when your house was rolling down the mudslide into the woods? And they're going to give you 750 bucks because you might need some baby formula and diapers. I mean, you're just trying to survive. So these issues, if you dig into them a little bit, seem kind of cut and dried. And a lot of what we're debating is the actual role of government, which is not to be an endless bureaucracy of self-sustainment and the coalescing of political power for the few at the top. So we're, we're getting far afield here from the design of the Founding Fathers. Government is supposed to protect the citizens to do justice to punish the wicked. And open borders put the citizens at risk of great harm. Just think about the influx and how many hundreds of thousands have been killed by fentanyl uh, coming in through the cartels who have free reign. Think of the uh, many testimonies of sex trafficking, children even being sold into sexual slavery, or right into sweatshops where they work endless hours. Yes, that's happening in this country because of the open borders policy and the great harm. Horrible things transpiring. Uh, and then, how many of these people are being recruited right away to form a voting bloc to coalesce political power? Uh, we know that's going on. The issue may not be so much compassion as it is gaining new voters. Some of you may have heard the news out of Arizona this most recent week. They reported that 218,000 people have already voted without any ID. And they started out with some much smaller number and then a little larger number, and now they're up to 218,000. And the leadership in the state, the governor, attorney general, etc., have said, don't worry, we're, we're going to really address this issue after the election. And there's kind of just the attitude of, you need to trust us. But there again, we don't have law and order governing our voting system, which really compromises the confidence we have in it. And we need to remember, you know, some, some Christians even are, crowing about how we need to submit to the governmental authorities in Romans 14. Our founders set the United States of America up so that we, the citizens, are the sovereigns. We have the say, and we exercise our say by who we vote for. And that's why the system of voting cannot be compromised. The citizens must have confidence in it. And here, stories like this just are not good. So we hope that the true, true vote will carry the day. Okay, Springfield, Ohio. That's been a story in the news. Community of 30,000 was added to 60,000. So in other words, you increase your population by 50%. Wasn't it interesting when he was talking about how originally if something wasn't enumerated as a federal power, it was automatically a state power? And the states started out with the say in what immigrants were allowed into their area. Uh, local communities had the say. Well, they were the ones who were going to be dealing with these people, right? I wonder if anybody from the federal government took the time to go to Springfield and say, you know, we're considering bringing 30,000 immigrants into your community. How do you feel about that? They were just run over. And there are a lot of stories there, and the left is really promoting these stories that, well, 
We need to have compassion. We need to be taking care of the needs of these people. But there are some thorny issues going on. When you bring in that many new children and they're all added to the classrooms, what does that do to the educational experience of the citizen children? And most of them who come in can't speak the language. So now there's an inordinate amount of time that's got to be laid aside to deal with all. It just seems like there's been no practical consideration of the impact of some of these decisions that are being made. Now they need housing. And rents are being pushed up so drastically as some of the citizens can't afford the new levels of rent. So now the citizens are without housing. Food prices because of the demand on food. Accidents. People are able to get driver's license without ever being citizens, without going through any kind of a safety class. They don't know how to drive. They've had a great uptick in accidents. And they've even had some citizen children greatly harmed by these accidents that people just don't know how to drive. That's not condemnation of them as people or being malevolent instead of compassionate. It's just the practical considerations. Uh, there have been more accidents, higher housing content, uh, costs, animal controversies. I don't think I have time to get into that, but there's another slant on that that's not really being uh, investigated very thoroughly. Did the federal government ask those citizens how they felt about this? Not at all. And that's why the citizens are gathering together, having meetings and saying, nobody asked us about this. Why are we having to deal with all this? Well, it's because you don't count. We're going to do what we want. We're the government. Oh, well. FEMA is now saying they don't have enough money for emergency relief in dealing with Hurricane Helene. They already spent the money on relocation of illegal immigrants and supporting them with benefits. This doesn't seem sound or sane. In America, the citizen is the sovereign. Citizenship with all its rights is considered a gift from God. And the founders saw government's job as protecting the individual liberties of the citizen. The individual was sovereign. The government couldn't come in with more force and just crush the individual citizen and do whatever they want. It was about protecting citizen rights, and now we're being overrun. This is robbed from rightful citizens when government confers equal or greater rights upon non-citizens. This happens when governance is exercised without the consent of the governed, which is what is going on. I want to share some excerpts from an article from News Nation. This is something that's been on my heart for quite a while. I, I hear it very rarely being covered or talked about, but I think it's a grievous thing going on in a hellish partnership being formed between the federal government and certain religious groups. This was an article from News Nation. From the local to the state and federal level, Americans are paying a hefty price for the humanitarian crisis at the southern border. Remember what they said? There's nothing in the Constitution that says the federal government is responsible for compassion. That's their justification, right? We're being compassionate. So we have this crisis at the southern border. And in a way, the federal government is able to hide the true cost of the border crisis from the public through NGOs. NGOs stands for non-governmental organizations. And not all of them, but most of them have a religious affiliation. The majority of migrants arriving in cities like New York or smaller towns across America do so with the help of non-governmental organizations, these NGOs. Organizations like charities or religiously affiliated nonprofits. 
In the past two years, Border Patrol holding stations have constantly been at overcapacity and dealing with a massive influx of migrants crossing illegally into the U.S. When this happens, Border Patrol releases processed migrants to NGOs to shelter, feed, and coordinate travel for migrants to their final destination. So in other words, all these immigrants just show up, crash in the border, Border Patrol's overwhelmed. They don't know what to do with them. NGOs are there saying, we'll take them off your hands. Once received, whether it be the adult population or the families, the sites will then work with them. And the general term that we use is we go through a processing. John Martin, the deputy director for the Opportunity Center for the Homeless, said, that processing is to facilitate travel to the destination of their choice. So anyone can show up. There's no screening. There's no vetting. There's no process. They're turned over to the NGO, and they say, I want to go to this city. And the NGO helps them get there. Now, here's the devilish aspect in the details. NGOs receive billions of taxpayer funds through several federal departments like the Department of Homeland Security and Health and Human Services. According to Forbes, the NGO Catholic Charities USA received $1.4 billion from government support compared with $1 billion in private donations. So in this particular year, I'm sorry, I don't have the date handy. Recent year, the Catholic Church got $1.4 billion from government, $1 billion from their offerings in church. Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services reported more than $93.1 million in U.S. government grants in its 2021 financial statement, making taxpayer-funded grants more than 80% of its total support. So they found the cash cow here, and they are raking in millions and even billions of dollars. That number would only climb as the Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service would receive $182 million in grants in the fiscal year 2022 from the Department of Health and Human Services. So $93 million from taxpayer-funded grants. Okay. Nothing, nothing set aside for emergency use in case a segment of the populace comes under the most severe hurricane that we've had in a long, long time, and their houses being swept away. Oh, no, we gave it all to these people over here who came into the country without being vetted. Some of them are murderers and rapists, but, hey, they deserve compassion. So this is what's going on, and I cannot figure out why believers in any of those Institutions aren't really upset about a church organization really conspiring to break the law. And how many of these are cartel members, cartel operatives? There was a recent news story about how The federal government lost track of 32,000 children. How did they know? They never showed up for their hearing. The government has no idea where they are. How many of these people were helped in by one of these NGOs, and now they've lost track of them, and they're serving the desires of cartels? We have instances in Aurora, Colorado, where Venezuelan gangs have taken over entire uh, apartment complexes. And you listen to the mayor, and he's kind of trying to soft sell the impact. 
Well, the people who live in the apartments, the citizens of the United States of America aren't soft selling it. They're saying we're scared to death. And they just bust into our apartment and take what they want. I don't think that's the kind of country most citizens want to live in. The same thing has been happening now in Chicago, where Venezuelan gang members are setting their boundaries for what they consider to be their turf. And other foreign cartel members are in opposition, and citizens in Chicago are living in deathly fear that all out wars are about to break loose in Chicago. So, brothers and sisters, what can we conclude? The major problem we have with immigration, with the immigration issue in America right now, is not a lack of compassion, but a lack of the rule of law. Just look at the efforts of the citizens there in response to Hurricane Helene and people losing everything. Now, Samaritan's Purse, they do a lot of advertising, and Christians from everywhere support them. As you know, a convoy of hope, you've never heard of that before. No advertising, completely reliant on contributions from church members through the fellowship of the Assemblies of God, and yet mighty works being done by people who have a Christ-like help toward or heart toward those in need. But when it comes to the government who says they're doing everything in the name of compassion, well, they have nothing left to give to the citizens. They have no protection to offer. It's all been spent build up the voter base. I hope we're upset enough to vote. The founders set up a system so that the country could thrive and function. But it could only thrive and function because of the foundation they laid. What was that foundation? The bedrock foundation of America is the Bible. Praise and worship ministry, why don't you come on up here? The bedrock foundation of America is the Bible. Without doubt, this was the document that the Founding Fathers most relied upon in establishing America. Ask yourself when you vote, which candidate is most closely aligned with a biblical worldview? Which one most departs from a biblical worldview? That is how you vote your values as a Christian. Father God, we ask you to help us to be good stewards as citizens of this one nation under God. Help us to strike the balance between compassion and law and order. Help us to be led by your Holy Spirit. Help us not to succumb to resentment but rather to put our focus on being faithful ourselves and trusting in your good outcome for our families, for our churches, and for our governance. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said...